Lecture 12, Priests as Disciples of Jesus Pope Francis has repeatedly warned priests from becoming overly enamored with their office and the power associated with the priesthood that they forget to serve the people of God. When this occurs, either in the direction of the cultic leadership model or in the direction of the servant leader model, priests are more likely to abuse their position of power because they have forgotten that they are priests, that they are disciples of Jesus Christ. In outlining the characteristics of a priest who serves the church because he's disciple of Christ, Pope Francis, as explained by Cardinal Vincent Nichols, provides seven pillars of the priesthood. And we will focus on the first pillar, which is being a disciple of Christ. And then because we're a disciple of Christ, we are to be close to him, we are to lead a life of service, we are to be ministers of mercy, we are to have a sim simple lifestyle, we are to be models of integrity, and finally to be a source of blessing for his people. In this lecture, we will elaborate on Pope Francis's warning against priestly clericalism and other related distortions of the priesthood by distinguishing between a church man from being a disciple of Christ. In a retreat, Father Grishel gave to priests. He defined churchmen as sociological figures who are identified as responsible for a particular religion. They are present to take care of the institutional aspect of religion. Grochelle further explained that churchmen can be both liberal social activists or caught up in the cultural aspect of the church and be highly conservative people. So he's saying that churchmen can be both liberal or identify with liberalism or identify with conservatism. To flesh out his definition of church men, Father Gershel referred to a sermon the Cardinal Newman gave titled Obedience Without Love as Instance in the Character of Balaam. In book, the book of Revelation describes this non-Israelite prophet of the Old Testament times as wicked. Balaam and his wickedness appears in Numbers chapter 23 through chapter 24. Despite being a prophet who at, who at times obeys God, Balaam, when confronted, confronted with helping the Israelites who are traveling through the desert, disobeys God by trying to place a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice fornication. In his sermon, Cardinal Newman first praises Balaam. He does so with this. Balaam was, in the ordinary, commonly received sense of the word, without straining its meaning at all, a very conscientious man. He was an honorable, religious man, with a great deal of what was great and noble about him, a man whom any of us at first sight would have trusted, sought out in our difficulties, perhaps made the head of a party, and anyhow spoken of with great respect. In explaining why, despite his many good qualities, Balaam was displeasing the eyes of God, Newman writes the following, which Groeschel included within his definition of a church man. Balaam's endeavor was not to please God, but to please self, without displeasing God, to pursue his own ends as far as was consistent with his duty. In a word, he did not give his heart to God, but obeyed him as a man may obey human law, or observe the usages of society or his country as something external to himself, because he knows he ought to do so, from a sort of rational good sense, a conviction of his propriety, expediency, or comfort, as the case may be. In other words, and this would be uh, quoting from T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral, the, the tempter, I think was the fourth tempter, is to do the good deed for the right reason is the greatest treason. Why? Because it signifies that at the depth of our being, we are following God's law, but for self-glorification, not for the glorification of God. And the tempter was tempting the temptation of the tempter was this, that martyrdom would be sought for the glorification of self and not for the glorification of God. Disciples of Christ In defining a disciple of Christ in contrast with the churchman, Grishel explained, Discipleship is a psychological figure in the sense of being personally based. He is a friend of God, of Christ, of the Church, as a mystical body of Christ, not primarily as an institution. 
and encouraging priests to develop their relationship, Groeschel said, Jesus Christ invites one to discipleship since God is not distant but personal. Deepen your relationship with Jesus Christ with God. When we deepen our relationship with Jesus in an authentic manner, Jesus naturally deepens our relationship with God the Father since, as Jesus said, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him, the Father, who sent me. Paul Witz thinks it's important to stress the interconnectedness between developing a personal relationship with Jesus and, through the Holy Spirit, with God the Father, because research of a psychiatrist colleague of his, who has worked with so many members of the Catholic clergy, had described the psychology of a number of priests whom he has seen. These priests have a strong attachment to Jesus, but a weak attachment to God, especially as God the Father. They also strongly reject, sometimes even hate, the Pope. Priests deepen their relationship with Jesus and through Jesus with God the Father when they heed Jesus' request to, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The education Jesus and Frites priests needs to be properly understood, especially since many learned academic priests, as Groeschel points out, are so removed from the concept of discipleship and the reality of the living Word of God. Father Anthony Gittens, in teaching what Jesus means in this context and other, by learning, distinguishes learning from academic learning, where students gain intellectual knowledge from apprenticeship, which is direct practical learning as an apprentice, apprentice potter learns about pottery by creating pottery under the guidance of a master potter. Learning from Jesus as an apprentice takes place both by developing a life of prayer, which open our eyes to recognize Jesus in others, especially in those who are most forgotten and marginalized, as previously specified by Pope Francis, and by serving those in need. When what we do is inspired by deep relationship with Jesus, including the necessary work maintaining the institutional reality of the Church in this present life, we will feel moved to go out of our comfort zone and evangelize. Bishop Barron in Catholicism compares evangelization by the church to Noah's ark once the ark lands on dry land. Like Noah, we are called by God to step out of the ark, out of our comfort zone to bring God's order into a highly chaotic world. The ark, writes Barron, was interpreted by both the rabbis and the church fathers as a microcosm of God's good order, maintained during a time of chaos, as a place where life was preserved behind carefully constructed walls during a season of death. And this is why the medieval architects endeavored to make the cathedrals look like ships. That microcosm of God's good order was not meant to hunker down permanently aboard the ark, but rather to flood out into the world and remake it. So the church gathers in a faithful remnant and shapes them according to God's mind. But then it purposely scatters them abroad like seeds on fertile ground. In his talk titled Priest, Prophet, and King, Barron further explains that like Adam, we have the vocation to Edenize, meaning to remake the entire world into a garden of paradise. Adam failed since he sinned. Despite Adam's failure, we, through Christ, the new Adam, are to cultivate a garden of life in this world. We first begin doing so, this applies specifically to priests, by ordering the entire cosmos around worship, around the Eucharist, Radiating out of this church is a spiritual energy reordering the cosmos around Christ. In the work of evangelization, it is imperative for priests and those who collaborate with them to remember that as Pope Francis was previously quoted, we are not isolated and we are not Christians on an individual basis, each one on his own or her own. No, our Christian identity is to belong. We are Christians because we belong to the church. It is like a last name. If the first name is, I am Christian, the last name is, I belong to the church. As applied to evangelization, this means, explains Vonier, the church progresses as a conquering power, not as one which goes forth to capture individual souls. The salvation of souls is a very definite kind of work, for it is salvation through the church. Let the church be established and souls will be saved. 
Catholic communities priests help to establish are to evangelize by their witness to a social order inspired by the kingdom of heaven to come and experience in a tangible way through the Eucharist and communities which allow themselves to be ordered by Eucharistic life. Those who have no faith may come into the church, Vonnier explains, actually as a converted believer or unconsciously as one who is purified through influences whose origin he does not know. Every time a mass is celebrated by the church, may the priest celebrant and the congregation recapture the understanding of the dismissal as a calling to extend the mass throughout the day by praying for unbelievers to at least unconsciously accept Jesus Christ. In addition, May they actively witness and evangelize to a new life, a life in Christ. God bless.